watching tonight as well. So thank you guys all for tuning in tonight. This is going to be a great show. I mean, how could it not be with Brian Hill as our guest tonight? I'm so excited to introduce him. So Brian Hill is the co-owner and head coach uh, at The Complete Combatant, and he's an H&K brand ambassador, just like Defenders USA, and a presenter at national conferences. Brian inspires others through his mission of service to others as a person and as a coach and his brilliant methodology in, in methodology in teaching. His straightforward yet intuitive approach to firearms has gained national attention, nationwide attention, and his extensive background in martial arts and decades of coaching experience, as well as his survival story of upbringing, has given him a unique perspective into helping others excel as high performers. Also, I want to remind you, please go back to the other two episodes we've done with Brian Hill, and you'll learn a lot more about him. Uh, the first episode was in August of 22. And in that episode, he talks about his background in more depth. Um, he has an inspiring story of strength through struggle, where he talks about um, how his past has impacted him and how it's shaped him into the person that he is today. And then also go back and check out the February 22 episode. Sorry, 23. <laughs> I haven't been doing it that long. February 23 episode where he talks more about mindfulness and self-image. So again, another episode worth its weight in gold. I encourage you to check those out as well. So tonight we're going to be diving into topics, as I said before, that you have shouted out in our Facebook group and uh, that you have expressed as what you're currently struggling with. So we decided to devote a show to just that. So among those topics, finding time, conquering overwhelm, growing skill and confidence and developing resilience. So let's bring Brian Hill on back onto the show. Hey, Brian. Hey, what's going on? I'm starting to feel like Norm here. This is my cheers. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. This place you're always welcome. That's for sure. And we always I, love I to hear that. from you. <laughs> what a great intro so, too. Thank you. Yeah. Do you like that? I yeah, did. Well, well done. It was all true. It was all true. It wasn't off your website. Some of it was, but some of it, I just, you know, I thought that was the intro I wanted to give you. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> it was wonderful. I appreciate Good. it. Good. So of the struggles that I listed earlier, which one do you hear the most commonly? Do you want me to read those off again? Sure. So they talked about in the chat, uh, finding time, conquering mm -hmm. overwhelm, growing skill and confidence. And I threw in developing resilience because I think that's tied into it. But of those mm -hmm. things, what do you hear most commonly? I, I think probably for most of us, the, the idea of feeling overwhelmed by the pressure and not having enough time to do what we need to do is probably mm -hmm. the, the essential thing that uh, the other two are really, really important. But I think that's the one that actually derails our success most often. Um, we spend more in time being busy than we do being productive. And uh, we don't yeah. live with the intentionality that we used to uh, because we have so many things that draw to our attention constantly. So I would love to get into that. Uh, I've got some, some good things to share with people and, and it, it, it's a really tough subject. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny. I think I do want to just let you go on that. But I also want to say I want to talk about later this idea of balance because it gets talked about over and over again. And I've got my own thoughts on that. So maybe after you unpack some some things about conquering overwhelm and time management, maybe we could get into that. So take it away. So, you know, one of the things that we're all facing now is uh, you and I talked about this a little bit is the idea of cognitive ease. And what the idea of cognitive ease is that we tend to do things that don't challenge us. Uh, scrolling through our, our feed is one of those things. Uh, not thinking very much, getting a uh, confirmation bias going where all our ideas are kind of in an echo channel. And what happens is the brain kind of goes into a neutral pattern then. And uh, we don't, we're not really geared to be like that. But we don't have a very good sense of time. Um, you know, we're all... Uh, one of the reasons we use a timer in training is because you cannot be trusted to tell time well. When we do something very well, it feels effortlessness and it feels like it took no time. And when we do something mm -hmm. poorly, it feels rushed. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are living our life in that rush sort of feeling because we're doing a lot of tasks. We're very busy, but we're not being intentional about our task. 
And I'm not going to say you can make a calendar and you can switch all these things, but I want you to know that we're all kind of feeling this way. And mm -hmm. the thing for a human being to feel it, 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 truly alive is challenge. Uh, if we're not challenging ourselves mentally and physically, and we're not taking risks to become better, uh, we're going to find ourselves discontent. And we are facing a, a national epidemic of depression right now because while people feel really connected and busy, they don't feel content. And mm -hmm. this is what time truly means to us. And it's something that uh, we'll, we'll dive into how to, how to develop the work and how to become more meaningful with it. Yeah. I've got so much I could say about that just right out of the gate, but I want to leave. I've been reading a book called The Comfort Crisis. I'm going to wait until mm -hmm. towards the end of the broadcast to share that with people, but that ties in exactly um, to what you're talking about. Um, and I was going to add to that, and then if I, I didn't write it down, so it went in my head, and now it went, whoop, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how my brain works sometimes. And if you said That's it again, it would trip it again, I'm sure. And I would bring, I would have it back right in my head, but. I think that's how we all work though. You know, that's, that's part of it. Our cycles of concentration are fleeting and it's mm -hmm. hard to stay on task. And that's what this time issue really is. I uh, just demonstrated it. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was totally planned. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so when we come down to training, we have to, we have to really identify what is essential. You know, what are we, what is our clear goal in this? What is essential to training? And when I speak to people, they think they need to dry practice, you know, uh, for hours a day to get where they want to. And it's simply not the way we work. Um, the overwhelmed feeling is uh, there's a, there's an effect called the Zerniki effect, which means that we remember incomplete task and we forget completed task. Uh, if you find yourself constantly feeling overwhelmed or you're woken up in the middle of the night what you should always do is write out a simple plan of how you're going to attack these things. This will give you tremendous time that you didn't have before because this effect makes us constantly concerned about things that we haven't completed, that we feel are incomplete, and they, they gnaw at us and they eat our attention and they take up the very small bit of processing power we have as human beings. So making a basic plan is always the first step. And I know that's, I mean, there's no... No coach in the world that hasn't said that, but a simple plan of what is essential for you is always the first step. I remember what I was going to say. Can we bounce Good. around? Are you tapping yep. a pen? Because it's driving me nuts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I turned your volume way up. Now I can hear the pen tapping. Um, it's like whenever you're listening to somebody chew their food. Okay. That's a whole other program. So I remember what I was going to say now, which is, Okay, so we know that accepting challenges, challenging ourselves in various ways is advantageous to us. That hel it helps us grow, it helps build confidence, resilience, everything, right? We know that intellectually. But yet we still don't do it. We still don't step up to the challenge. And this is a twofold question, knowing all the benefits of that, why don't we then do it? Well, we want to be rewarded. That's that's the problem. Is so everybody we're addicted wants to, to be, dopamine through our social oh, media? Oh yeah, and, yeah. And just reward in general. You know, uh, parents did it to us. If you eat your dinner, you get something sweet. You know, mm. if you do your work, you get an A. Uh, you know, if you compete, you get a medal. These are all rewards that mm -hmm. simply don't exist for us. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't mean anything to us. So part of the problem is you must accept if you're going to get anywhere, you have to wade through the sewage to get to the clean water. But you know, <laughs> Andrew Huberman talks about finding the reward in the work. That's right. And he it has to be randomized. Yes. yes. And so. what, what he always talks about is it's a random reward. Uh, it doesn't right. always come at the end of the process. It comes randomly. And the struggle and the striving for it, and when it simply appears, is the moment we have to take the joy and victory and we have to enjoy it and know that it's fleeting, that we don't get it every time that we go right. to do a workout or we go to practice or we sit down and make a plan. It may not be rewarding in that moment, and you may not get the reward that day, but what most people don't understand is the way that exponential growth works. They understand linear growth. But if I offered you today, 
one penny and I said, I'm going to double it every day for 30 days, how much money do you think you would have? I'm not good at math. <laughs> no, nobody is. That's really the point of this. I'd have nobody more is. money than I do today. <laughs> it's about $5.6 million. That's what exponentiality does. But if you do this work every day, you won't see any benefit right now, but you will be transformed at the end of the year because it will not grow linearly. It will grow exponentially and it will affect mm -hmm. all things in your life and it will affect your self mastery. So the true reward is getting this exponential growth, but we never needed to think about exponentiality. We're not good at it as human beings. Linear growth is what we thought about. And people think if they just do the one thing, they get a reward and they get another reward and they start to improve a little bit at a time. But hmm. that's not how it works. You suddenly grow into something extra. If you don't believe me, uh, I hate to say this, but there's a video of me shooting the FBI qualification test. Uh, I guess it's about seven or eight years old. Uh, it was the first video I've ever done. Uh, when I was stood in front of the camera, I could not manage the camera. I could not manage the shooting. Uh, it is an atrocious video compared to who I am now, but I'll never take it down. I want people to see how much you can grow if you apply this exponent exponentiality to what you're doing. I want it to stay there. So it reminds me of where I came from because the other problem is our hindsight bias. Oh, I knew it was going to work out this way. Well, that's not true. That's not the way things work. Uh, we don't know how we work like that. So you can grow. You may not get rewarded now, but you do the work anyway, because that's the striving and the struggle. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen is you're going to get angry. Uh, simmering emotions, emotional ambivalence and simmering anger are essential to learning occasionally, because that means we're dissatisfied with the status quo. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be the same anymore. And we're willing to heat ourselves up to change. Uh, as a very angry young man, of course, I was always offered the advice of don't get angry. Boy, if you say that to an angry person, yeah. oh, it just makes yeah. me angrier. Yeah. But when somebody framed it and said, this is the agent of change, you don't like what's going on. So let's change it. Let's yep. change it. Let's change ourselves and become something more. And that's mm -hmm. the, the secret to this is that you're not going to get rewarded right now. Uh, but you will be a new person in a year if you'll do the work and if you'll struggle and you'll do it. 90 days sets a pretty good habit. Um, most people don't know how to set a habit. So uh, for me, I have this place where I work out. Uh, I get up every morning at the same time. Uh, not as early as Jocko Willing, but I'm pretty early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a big thing for him, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I get out here where nobody can interfere with me. And I'm not a morning person because I've been teaching martial arts until 10 or 11 p.m. at night my whole life. But I get out of bed. And when I get in here, uh, I, I take care of business right away and I get to work. And it, it's, it's a habit. It's a trigger when I step in here that I have things to do. And I, I don't even care if I feel like doing it. I just do at least one thing. And then oh, after that, that I do another one video. thing. I saw a great thing. video the other day that talked about, and I, I did a tidbit, guys, last week on motivation versus discipline because I had multiple light bulb moments over the last few months. But I saw a video the other day that talked about, um, it was just saying, I do it when I'm sad. I do it when I'm happy. I do mm -hmm. it when I'm angry. I do it when I, and the whole point was you do it anyway because you know it's the mm -hmm. right thing to do no matter where you are mentally that day. And I think as a culture, we have grown to be a feel good culture that we do what feels good. We do what we want to do. And we we have the luxury to do that because we are incredibly spoiled overall. And, mm -hmm. and we have everything at our fingertips that we could ever want. Yet we're some of the most unhappy people mentally. Um, and, and we're just not happy. And um and that is, that's an epidemic, I think. Uh, and so getting back to, I think all of us have this in us to get back to the roots of, if you want long-term happiness in your life, then you do have to do the, the short-term things that maybe you don't want to do. And one more thing I want to say before you, if I'm sure you have something to say about this, is there's a person in my life that I think of that pops, he pops in my head 
every single time I think of discipline. And he's 85 years old now, and he's not able to do the things he used to be able to do. But when I was a little girl growing up, he got up every morning and he had chores to do every morning. It didn't matter what temperature it was. It didn't matter how he felt about it. And I mean hours and hours of chores, right? Twice a day. And I, I get it. He had, you know, he was a farmer. He had animals to take care of. And if he didn't do his job, then they wouldn't survive or thrive. But the point of it is, I never heard him complain. I never heard him say, oh, I got to get up early and I got to put on these three layers of clothes and, oh, what's the weather like today or whatever. I never heard that. I also never heard, I mean, I know he was happy to do it because that was his like life. That's all he knew. But I never heard him be overly excited about it either. He wasn't like giddy happy going and doing things. He just did the things. He had a list every day written on his hand and pen of the things that had to be done. And he just got up and did those things with like almost no emotion about it, at least not outwardly towards anybody. He just did it. And I don't mean he kind of did it. I mean, by the book, did it every single day of his life. And that's just how he lived. And so I'm sure you guys know people like that as well. But it seems as though... um we, a lot of us don't have to do those things anymore. And, and we've kind of lost our way in some, in some regard. And so my question then, Brian, if you don't have anything to add to that necessarily, but I, I mean, I really look up to him for that because um, he didn't put his stuff on any of his family or anyone around him. He just knew the work that had to be done and he just did it diligently. And I think that that is a lesson to be learned by all of us that um that is that's a good way to look at at certain things we know that need to be done in our lives in order to improve our lives in order to to do the things we know we should do um but my question to you then is to the people out there that that get up you know that get let's say okay they finally made up their mind they're going to get out of bed early and they're going to do whatever the thing is they know they need to do let's say for example how do they get past the old voices in their head that obviously led them for so long to have a lifestyle that they, you know, or a practice routine or lack thereof. Um, how do they get over that hump to get into where they need to be mentally? You know, it's not easy. Uh, it, it's work, but it's mindful work. And as you relate your story, what struck me is that that's a life of service. Uh, yeah. You owe yourself the same service. Uh, you are something that interacts with people you love and you do work on a daily basis, yet you refuse to take care of yourself. So therefore, you deprive everybody of the best version of you because you would rather just be available and less than you could be than to spend some time to master yourself, to become mindful mm -hmm to become present, and to do the work that you were called to do. You're, this is your passion. You've decided upon it. If it's not, find another one. But you are alive and willing to do these things. And it is going to be hard work, and you're not going to want to do it, and you're not going to enjoy it most of the time. I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I don't always enjoy it. And I don't look for happiness. I look to be content with who I am. And I look to be a better husband. I look to be a better teacher. I look to be a better shooter. I look to be a better friend. I look to be a better man of character uh, because I spend 20 or 30 minutes in the pursuit of self-mastery in service to myself, which will help everybody else. And the real key to it is to quit before you're tired when you practice. If, mm -hmm. you, if you keep driving for that one perfect rep, what you will do is grind yourself into dust. Uh, we have term for this it's called the grinder uh, what you do is you do the work and when you feel like you're really into it and you've gotten to a certain point uh, and but you're not tired yet that's when you stop and what will happen is your mind will be eager to do more but if you train until you're so burned out 
you won't want to do it the next day. And what happens over about 90 days, give it three months, you create a habit of triggers. And uh, my wife said this to me once. She said, you're a better person when you practice. So she's always <laughs> going to encourage me to practice, right? <laughs> you know, she left today to do something. And I'm outside working the bag. Uh, not because I'm ever going to have another MMA fight or uh, hopefully an ever fist fight or anything, but because I don't enjoy cardio and I don't enjoy working out that much, but I am a better person for the rest of the day. So if I stay in a full process and learn how to accept the discomfort, that allows me to be resilient, which is going to be a big part of our discussion later on of how to yeah. become more resilient, you know? Yeah. And, and in that process, you learn a lot about yourself. You do. You do. So be who you're supposed to be, you know, and uh, do you want it? You know, I believe Seneca said it, you know, it's something about cowering underneath the covers instead of being about your business on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a real interesting thing, too. If you hit the snooze button, you secrete a series of hormones that make you drowsy again and you lose about four hours of your day because you can't be as alert. So if you're going to get up, get out of bed. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, just get out of bed. That's why everybody feels worse after they snooze. You're not really, you are stealing time from yourself. Uh, just get up. Uh, go and do what you're supposed to. And that's what you clearly described, which was a, a poignant discovery of, of a man and doing his work. And he just got up and did it. No complaints, yeah. no whining. Just go do your work. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, hate, I, to, I hate to brag on him, but like he's 85 now. He doesn't feed cattle mm -hmm. anymore, but he still has an outdoor stove. So in the wintertime, <laughs> he, he, well, I don't know if he even goes to bed by midnight, but at midnight he has to stoke the stove again. So, I mean, obviously it's in the winter, so you got to get dressed to go outside in the cold, stoke the stove again and, and come back in and go back to sleep. I mean, yep. there's just a different breed of people, you know? And, um, Anyway, I I can't say enough about him because he's my hero. But anyway, I won't get emotional <laughs> about that. So going back to time and overwhelm for for if I had a nickel for every time I heard someone say I'd really like to train more, but I don't have enough time. There's not enough time in the day. What do you say to that? Uh, you know, there's there's no perfect answer to this. I wish there was. Uh, but I ask them what their priority is. Uh, I always ask what the priorities are. You know, when we look, when we really look, uh, we used to do this as a strength and conditioning coach. I did this a lot. I'd ask people about their diet and they tell me they ate pretty well. And I said, all right, uh, write down everything you eat for the next three weeks. Now, there's a trap in that because as soon as you become mindful about what you're eating, you're afraid to write down all the garbage you've been eating. So you stop eating <laughs> it. Yeah. So at the end of three I weeks, everybody lost weight. That's how the brain works. Uh, that's what I tell people is when they, when they tell me they don't have time, I ask them, do you spend time doing things that don't make you feel good? Uh, if you want to feel empty, sit down and scroll through social media for an hour mindlessly. And mm -hmm. it'll f feel very important, but afterwards you'll feel very empty. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't content us. It doesn't challenge us, but we spend time in front of things. And I think one of the greatest things about the internet is we can learn and we can grow and we can challenge ourselves, but we choose things that are easy constantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think there's nobody in the world that can't find 10 minutes to move, to practice, to do something to improve mm -hmm. it if it's worthwhile. And then what happens is you start changing how you do it. Another thing I'd suggest is uh, make sure you get some sunshine before 1030 in the morning. Andrew Huberman talks about this also. Mm -hmm. uh, reset your, set your rhythm so you go to sleep. One of the reasons we don't have time is we stay up until all hours. We're not really well rested. We eat poorly. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're very inefficient as human beings. And it's not a lack of time. It's just as we're going to talk about uh, later on is it's a lack of, of really struggling with us. And that's, that's what I want you to feel. If you, if you don't feel good about where you are, you can change that. But that you is, have to be intentional. Yeah. That is the best news of the day though, Brian, what you just said mm -hmm. there. If you're not happy with where you are, you can change that. You have the power to change it. And usually it's simple, but not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Usually it's very simple and people get into the minutia of whatever it is that they start, you know, going down the hole about. And really it, you know, you can usually narrow it down to like three things you could do differently that would completely change your life. But Mm -hmm. it's like they want to spend more time on all the little detailed stuff because that gives them something to think about and do when it's just really very simple. It's just not easy to do it. So And I'm not speaking because like I'm the best in the world and I've got it all figured out. I'm I'm speaking to everyone because I struggle with all of the same things, too. We all do. So. All right. Is there anything else you want to add to that before we go on to the next biggest struggle for our viewers? I think I think that's a good segue to uh, how to train and how to do it the right way. (laughs) <laughs> so that would be in the developing skill category because that was a yeah. couple people said that they're struggling the most with developing skill. So what would you say to that? Yep. Uh, here's, I tell people this and listen, guys, I, I come to you as the humble hypocrite that I am. Uh, I struggle <laughs> and I fail with all these things and I am full of hypocrisy and future Brian is utterly ashamed of the things I'm about to say, <laughs> probably. All right. But that's the way it works. So I would say this, that most people, when they train, they avoid the place they fear. They simply won't do the work that they fear the most. And when they say they don't want to do something and they dislike something, that's usually the one place they need to go do the work. And uh, I had a good incident of a, a, a gentleman in class and he has trained very hard in dry fire and he is exceptionally quick now. Unfortunately, he did not prioritize actually getting immediate feedback out of his training. He just prioritized speed. So what happened is he can shoot really quick without seeing anything. Mm. And what he fears is to actually pay attention because he is impatient by nature and he just wants to do. He doesn't want to see. And we're all afraid of that. We're all on our own hero's journey. And we have a place that we're deathly afraid of. Um, I'll share mine. Uh, I'm deathly afraid of being out of control. I've become such a controlling personality and structured that it showed up in my shooting. And I just don't want to let go sometimes. But if I trust myself, which I do, why don't I simply do the work and let go? And that's where the fear is. Because Mm -hmm. something may happen that I'm not in control of. Well, that's Mm -hmm. good. That's where the growth is. So I've spent the last three weeks doing things I don't enjoy as much in shooting, like running, running around and shooting, shooting multiple targets. You know, I'm very fortunate I can do all these things, but really just pushing myself so that I'm going to the place I fear. And uh, it has had unintended consequences. Uh, It's amazing. The uh, I had a nine month plateau I just overcame. Uh, I was told my splits would never get faster by people I was uh, very much admired and respected, and they were wrong because I was simply, and maybe they are too, afraid to go to the place that allowed me to have this sort of tolerance to speed. And the fear was lack of control. So I'd say if you want to train right, you got to identify who you really are. Uh, I taught a class last weekend and I had everybody do a self-assessment. They gave me all their scores and shooting. And then they told me about who they were psychologically. And then they told me how they handled stress. And then we did the whole day of training. And then we went like back at it. And I said, were any of you right? And they were like, no. Uh, The gathering of, of metrics during the day started showing somebody else existed in that moment. So if you want to train well, you got to figure out what you don't want to really do. And then you got to crawl in that cave and do the work. You got to fight that dragon and get the treasure. Uh, whatever hero story appeal, appears to you, but that's part of what struggling is: is doing things that are fearful. And I would never want to be without fear. Uh, it's what makes me feel alive. It's what's empowering me. It's what allows me to be fearlessness in my life. It doesn't mean I have an absence of fear. It means I relish it and I look forward to it. And I try to get ahead of it and Mm -hmm. I try to face it because that's the challenge. And uh, if I ever find myself without this feeling, I'm simply going to stop doing what I'm doing. I'll do something else that challenges me. Yeah, because you'll get bored. Mm -hmm. 
So what if you were to explore that dark black hole with a little bit of curiosity rather than just yes. outward fear? What if you said to yourself, what if I tried this? I mean, because you can dip your toe in as deep as you want to in mm. order to start, you know, seeing where where your limitations are mentally or physically or whatever. But if you never try to reach those limitations or operate on the edge of your comfort, then you never can grow. You know, practice is a microcosm of, of our life. It's a very small sliver. So if we're really afraid of something, it's a very small bit of it. You know, one of the greatest things about training in something like jujitsu is one of the primal fears is uh, the, the lack of space of suffocation of claustrophobia. And the first lesson in jujitsu is you're not going to die by pressure. You're going to learn to create space and you're going to learn how to breathe uh, because it's such a small thing and it's so well controlled. You can actually explore this and you can desensitize yourself to it. So it's not overwhelming anymore mm -hmm. and you can face it a little bit. And then the way you refrain from failure, you know, most people are utterly afraid of failure. That's the biggest thing that they fear. I found out. They just don't want to do poorly. And we've been, we've, we've run into a culture that in, especially in America is all positive talk. Self-talk is positive. It's not mm -hmm. though. It's three to one negative upstairs. Mm -hmm. And by Thank you for and, saying that out loud. Yeah, <laughs> it always will be, you know, it was kind of important in survival. Is that a bear? I think it's a bear. Well, no, <laughs> thank God I'm ready. Right? You know, yeah, we had, we had the air on the side of, of caution all the time. So we're inherently negative creatures, but how we deal with failure is the most important part. And the way that we debrief ourselves afterwards and we say, what did I learn from this situation? How, what can I take from it? Uh, where am I moving towards is the way we do it. But most people say, I failed. That's no good. It can't happen again. And mm -hmm. that's that's the absence of fear. And, the you know, to take a line from Dune, fear is the mind killer. Uh, as self-defenders, uh, if we allow the fear to take hold of us and we can't face such a small goal as, you know, like mine shooting fast, how can I face a, an opponent that's willing to do it to me mm -hmm. to dictate the pace of the fight? So this is my chance to to have that little bit of journey. And it's not it's not like a story. You know, uh, it's not beautiful. It's messy. It's murky. It's hard. You're distrustful. You're a mess. We're all a mess. Yeah. We're all a mess. And that is so important to say, because I think also, I mean, I know social media can be a great and wonderful thing, but I do think that it is not true to life. No. And I think we all know that, but we still see things on there. And we think, you know, that um, we don't realize how messy we all are and how we're all going through our own journeys and we're failing and, you know, messing up and we're we have to just we in my opinion i think in our little community we have here we have to support each other we're all going through the same stuff so why is nobody talking about it <laughs> you know it's not yeah. the highlight reel on instagram that that matters it's all the work you do you know that isn't on instagram that matters and that's what should be celebrated and talked about the hard stuff the murky stuff you know, it's, that's the fear though, right? I'm going to be vulnerable. People are going to think less of me uh, for saying the things that I did. And what we do is we, we create an illusion of, of just the parts that we want people to see. But the real truth of the matter is a great fear for most of us is to be vulnerable in any shape or form. Um, yeah. You know, there's such a, a, you know, there's so much information about it. So I started off this with something I don't like to share is that FBI test. And, you know, it's probably going to get a bunch of hits now. That's good. <laughs> uh, you know, because I also remember who I was, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm not changing into something that wasn't there. So I feel uh, the same way about my first video, too. Yeah. Because well, your I, show's I, grown, right? Yeah. And I've grown. Now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've grown. And it'll get, it'll hopefully keep getting better. I wanted to go back to something though, because so you guys don't know this probably, but um, I took Brian Hill's deliberate coaching was, I think it was last summer. And mm -hmm. um, you know, Brian is a very on the surface, well put together guy. Right. And <laughs> lots of, lots of wisdom and, 
and experience to share with people and cares about his students, cares about your growth. And you can tell. And so um, I remember we had like a private conversation months later, and I can't remember why or what it was about, but you revealed to me that, and you've said this on my show before too, but for people that haven't heard it, that you're, that on the inside, you're utter chaos. You said something like you're a very chaotic person. And I just like looked at him with like such confusion on my face. Do you remember that moment? I just couldn't believe that underneath the surface, there was so much chaos. And, uh, and now I can kind of see that a little bit, but, um, you know, what you see from people, you never know what's going on, you know, inside their mind. You never know what's going on at home. You never know. And so, um, you know, that's another a reason to be kind to people because you just don't know. Um, and in this case, that's not, not really the point, but it is just interesting that you never, you never, you can have a gut feeling about people, but you never really know. And so do you think it's interesting that I, was so surprised by that. Or, I mean, have you been practicing this persona for so long, Brian? I mean, what what is? You, I remember one time you said too about what you say to yourself every time when you get out of bed in the morning, which was yeah. so vulnerable and so powerful mm-hmm. to hear, because honestly, we all have that. And what was it that nobody cares? I think was what it yeah. was. Yeah. Yep, nobody cares. Well, you know, it's here's the thing. I, I uh, yeah, that's true, right? And I changed it, and nobody cares but me and all the other people, and quite a few of my friends are on here watching, and you all care. So it changes such a negative thing into a positive. And I was surrounded by, uh, you know, heroes that I watched crash in martial arts. Uh, they became vulnerable. They became less in who they were. And I think, uh, and anybody who has any bit of empathy can put themselves in another person's situation, but it's hard if we don't talk real. And uh, for some of us, we're passionate human beings. Uh, I, I am just, I am a passionate human being and I, 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 I would grind myself to dust without direction and structure. And I realized that early. So I had to go get some and I would never take the chaos away because it's incredibly creative, but mm-hmm. man, it's a tsunami inside me. You know, there's tidal <laughs> waves. And what it's I tell so reassuring myself, to hear you say yeah. that, Brian, because I feel the yeah. same way. Yeah, I, I beat myself up. You know, I don't think I'm good enough. And, uh, you know, we all suffer from imposter syndrome and things like that. But these are easily rectified. You just stay humble. You tell people the truth. And that was a moment of telling you the truth uh, that mm-hmm. matters. And I'm glad it was impactful. It's impactful for me to remember that, you know, uh, yeah, it all looks real put together. But. I think I had a class recently where I got a little irritated. I've got a pretty good temper. It doesn't show up very often, but it always comes from uh, somebody being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and coming from a combative environment that was easily rectified in a gym, (laughs) you know, but it's not on the range. And uh, I'd ask everybody in the class to do something. And uh, then I had to help somebody and I'd ask them to get about their task. So then I had to help somebody and I delayed the class and they kind of mocked me about it. And it hit me. And I was mad, not at them. I was mad that they could control me because uh, they didn't know better. Uh, But I allowed the mocking part of that to get to me. Mm -hmm. So in order to change that whole process, I gathered them together and I said, listen, guys, you've angered me right now. And I said, you've hurt me. And uh, I said, I ask you to do something for your own benefit. And instead of doing it, you decided to change it into something else. And I said, that's not what we're about here. And I said, if I've set a poor example, I apologize. I'll expect you to do better as I expect myself to do better. And it's the first time I've ever had a group of adults come to me and say, you know, I've never seen anger used constructively before. Mm. And it was a it was a mind opening moment for me. It's only taken 58 years to get to this point where I took my (laughs) anger and I didn't destroy relationships. and I didn't hurt somebody's feelings because, you know, when you're an insightful person and you got a temper, you can cut people to the quick. Mm -hmm. I've destroyed relationships like that. and You can't really come back. And it was the first time that. I recognize the problems stem from me, not from them, and how I was reacting to it. And that it gave myself enough time to realize that I could weather this storm and 
could be resilient to it and I could turn it into something creative instead of just doing something poorly. So oh, there's my great story. Yeah, it was, it was really, you know, that's I, hard I though believe, in the moment that's oh, gotta be hard. God. Yeah. Mm. Cause yeah. you want to go into default mode, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much more gratifying to yell, but <laughs> Short that's term. the easy path, right? Right. And what's the, the consequences? Path. And right. I'll tell you, good work is always hard up front. Yeah. It's always hard up front, but now mm -hmm. I have this story to share with people and it's impacted a lot of people and it's given me a certain control I never had. Yeah. So. That's really good stuff. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Sure. That's awesome. Okay. Well, you know, oh my gosh, I'm not even going to look at the time. I'm just going to, we're going to do the work, Brian. We're not going to look good. a lot at the time. We're not going to be here till midnight or anything, but there's a lot of yep. good stuff to unpack here. And you guys yeah. are the ones that brought this up in the Facebook group. And I want to address these things because uh, I think Brian has a lot of insight into these. And I really think that, um, that this is important. So the next thing, I don't know if this was something we talked about, but somebody posted, my biggest struggle is trying to find what is right for me. I have so many different opinions and suggestions on what is the right way to do something. I get stuck in my head in analysis paralysis. There's so many shooters and instructors in the world and not all agree on how something should be done. And I really want there to be a right way and a wrong way. What do you say to that? <laughs> Well, there's there's a whole bunch of things in that. Uh, one is a clustering illusion uh, that we seek patterns, and mostly what we do is random. Uh, you know, like people believe that, you know, the gambler's fallacy, things are going to get hot. Uh, they believe the same thing. If they just get the right training methodology, everything will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it does. It, the research shows otherwise. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you get going and you start. You mean like doing the silver something. bullet? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so that you're going to find the perfect workout. You're going to find the perfect dry fire. Uh, they'll create a structure, but the perfect workout is that you have a clear goal, and that's what you've got to settle is what's the true thing that's lacking in my shooting right now? You know, is it your draw? Is it your ability to call shots? Is it your ability to do multiple tasks at once? Whatever it is, figure it out. You got a clear goal now. So you stay present while you do that. And that's the hardest part of this. Uh, you're not, your mind's going to drift and you, you put your phone away, you turn it on silent. Uh, you don't play the TV in the background. You listen to some music if that helps you. And you just do the work and stay present. And then you look for the immediate feedback. And the question is always this. I wonder why that's happening. Here's something nobody probably knows that if, unless you've been performing for a long time. Sometimes when you get up the next day, you're a new person. I had a new habit show up in my class last weekend for me just out of nowhere suddenly my sights were coming in from the right never happened in my life before all right i was a new shooter and i was excited by that because i had to pay attention and here's the good news if we don't fail we don't pay attention if you're doing well you're not paying attention in the first place so the immediate feedback was i wonder why that's happening i got super curious about it and then I applied what I thought might be a correction and I didn't do it. And I applied another correction and that was kind of the right thing, but it wasn't all of it. And then I realized that I was using tension to judge the outcome. So I'd applied the brakes and applied a bunch of corrections without even seeing the problem. So the right way is to be ultimately curious about what you're doing, mm -hmm. to get the feedback and to challenge yourself. And mm -hmm. if you keep the idea of a clear goal, that's it. And that and to is be incredibly honest about difficult. It. Yes. And be curious. You want to see the failure. That's when your brain pays attention. Failure is the learning process for human beings. We, we, we learn to stand up and we fall down. And it's that's the first thing that we learn in walking. But as we get to adults, uh, we are so worried about people seeing us sometimes. And that's part of what we're talking about, that we don't see mm -hmm. ourselves anymore. So mm -hmm. just figure out that thing and then be real curious about it and wonder why it's happening and realize you don't need me to come and teach you. And you can just pay attention and let your body correct it. If you draw mm -hmm. your awareness to something, we're an answering machine at heart. If we get curious and you ask yourself the question, why is that happening? You'll have a cascade of answers that start coming to you. And if they don't come to you, then go for a walk. Let your brain go mm -hmm. into neutral and it'll answer that question. Mm -hmm. But that's what training yeah. really feels like. 
And some mm -hmm. days are super intense for me, you know, because I get super curious. I'm like, wow, I wonder why that's happening. Uh, and then some days it's like everything's pretty good today. I'm hey, just, Darcy. Train. Yeah. Had to shout out to Darcy. She took my class <laughs> last weekend. She did oh, really good. well, too. Yeah. Good. That's yep. outstanding. So here's my question then, before we move on to the next thing, mm -hmm. you said that people need to know who they are. Okay. I've heard you say that before. Yep. My question to you is, do some people think they know who they are, but they don't actually know who they are? And here's an example. On my last week's tidbit, I talked about motivation versus discipline. And I told all of you guys that I used to think I was the type of person that did something, burnt out, fell off the horse, got motivated again, tried again, burnt out. And it was like this vicious cycle that kept going on and on. And I realized that wasn't who I was. Because I had had success in other areas of my life, I started analyzing that and realized I, what I wasn't, what I was lacking was discipline in that particular area, not motivation. So how much of the time do you think people, I mean, when you say know who you are, what's the process to know who you are? Uh, you got to take some metrics. <laughs> you, you've got to take some data in uh, to know who you are. Um, so as a shooter you know, like, or as a, like, in, yeah. what kind of context are you talking here? Any context? It, does, it doesn't really matter. You know, okay. so if I want to lift weights, then, you know, I need to understand what I'm good at and what I'm poor at. If I'm an athlete, I need to understand it. But let's take shooting because it's really simple. And that's that's what kind of program we're in mm -hmm. uh, shooting. Uh, here's one that people don't want to know who they are. The timer blinks my mind. It means you don't want to know the who timer you are. blinks my mind. Yeah, they just they it just it's the neuralizer. It takes all my thoughts away. I don't want to be timed. What they're saying is I don't want to know who I am. I don't want to actually know what it is. I want to keep this idea that it's better than it is. Or mm. I don't want to shoot a bullseye and I don't want to be scored. Or I don't want to go to a competition because I might fail. And these are all the areas where you're starting to realize you're not who you think you are. And I'll tell you, as a fight coach, this happened quite a time. You know, guys in the locker room, they'd have a long speech about it, what they were going to do and how they're going to handle the guy. But we both knew it wasn't true. And then we would mm. see who it was in a fight. And I had a guy who uh, he only won about 50 percent of the time. Uh, and he had really good coaching from not just me, but from other coaches, too. But he would always borrow the other guy's strategy because it had mm -hmm. to be better than his own. And he'd like to show him he's better at that strategy, though the other guy had practiced on it. So, you know, you, you collect stuff that you you realize you don't want to do. And so like I use a timer a lot in class and I use bullseyes and I use scoring and I, I, I do man versus man, woman versus man competitions and all those things. And I, I look for people when they say, ah, this makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, all right, now we're starting to see who you are. Mm -hmm. Psychologically, we tend to either make decisions too hastily. And that means that we're addicted to the sensation of going ahead and doing something or we take too long. And mm -hmm. I've talked about this before, but it comes down to the four cognitive biases of what's important, what's the order of process, how much information, how much time do I have? Almost mm -hmm. always out of those four, there's one you don't want to deal with, you know? So for me, it was time. Uh, I'm a super accurate shooter. I didn't want to deal with time. Uh, for some people, like when you're teaching a beginning lesson, if they fall out of the process in any way in the order, they stop. They go back to the beginning, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. You're practicing one, two, and three over and over again, but you're not getting through four that you really needed. Right. So that's when I say you need to know who you are. If you have an aversion to something, <laughs> it's probably you need to look at that really closely and start doing it. And then, you know, like, like Adam this week, he shot the air marshal drill and he said, ah, you know, it's a pretty good test. But I think Adam of six or seven years ago would have found it a ridiculously hard test. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's improved so much in his shooting and it's, it's evident as he gets better. And then, you know, we forget where we came from. So, right. We're all starting something, you know, what's the four processes yeah. of learning, uh, learn how to do it safely, learn how to be accurate enough to do the task, then learn how to be efficient and then see if you can put enough pressure on you while, and do the process continuously. That's all there is to it. Right.
again, simple, not easy. <laughs> again, again, again. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So we're going to get into uh, the last few topics of the night here very quickly um, here in just a minute. And they are consistency, motivation, discipline, resilience, and confidence. Actually, that's quite a few things, but they all kind of tie together. Mm -hmm. So, but before we do that, and Brian, you may have a win of the week, um, but I'm going to share my win of the week this week. So guys be putting those in the chat if you have a win of the week. So my win of the week this week was I, I taught a, a handgun fundamentals class and I had one of the best classes ever and some of the best help ever. My husband and my friend Mike helped me with the class and we had some really good students. But um, my most favorite thing in the world as a coach is to see a breakthrough. And um, I watched this person struggle and struggle, but stayed in there and and trusted me along the journey and finally made a breakthrough. And when that happened, I saw his focus narrow and I saw his confidence grow in real time as he was shooting. And he like, it was like a light bulb moment where he it like was like, oh my gosh, I really can do this. I, I can do that. I'm doing it. Look, I'm doing it. It's like, I could have pictured him saying that. Look, I'm doing it. And then what happened was, and this was the best part because this is what always happens when somebody gets excited because they finally figured something out. Then they hang on to it really tightly because they're afraid to let go of that because they're like, oh, well, I don't want that to go away. I want to keep shooting really, really, really good, you know, and we all want that. But then the harder he started grabbing on to that, the more I saw him start to slip in his shooting. And all he needed from me was just to remind him that just a few minutes prior to that, he had proven to himself that he was competent, that he was capable of doing the task. And as soon as I did that, he rose back up again and, you know, and I, in that moment, I was kind of like the little voice in his head just for a short mi minute, you know, but he was able to um, get back into the, into the uh, flow, I guess, of what he was doing. And it was just really, really amazing to be able to, to witness that. And I know, Brian, you have witnessed that many times, but as a coach, I mean, that never gets old, never mm -hmm. gets old. And it, 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 it rewards me just as much as him and, and the student gets so much out of it. And, and I think what's most rewarding and powerful about that guys is that when someone is developing skill and confidence in themselves, your role as a coach is not just to get them there, but to get them to not need you anymore, to have that be their story and their thing, not yours, has nothing to do with you. And then they can go on and, and do great things. So, and, and that is exactly what you and Adam Winch do as coaches as well. But that's a win of the week. I mean, that's a win of like the year, but <laughs> mm -hmm. do you have a win that's of the week, one. Brian? It I do. Is. I changed my mind. Oh, I you changed, changed your mind, mind about what? Uh, I taught a class that was about uh, shooting the core four better, which is my belt testing and my patch testing. And uh, there's a big hesitancy to teach the test because, you know, people should practice and then they should be tested. But uh, having such a narrow, clear goal allowed me to really connect with the shooters. And it allowed me to do a great assessment and diagnostics. And it allowed us to have the same same privilege that you just shared where together uh, we advocated for success. And I watched somebody who uh, has struggled so mightily with himself. Uh, he's so stubborn with himself. Uh, do things that he didn't think was possible before. And I saw all of them do it. And it came from this test was very narrowly defined. The class was. It's four skills. Uh, but it encompassed everything we talked about. And as long as I'm teaching the entire process, it doesn't matter whether I start at the beginning or I start at the test. It's all the same thing. And so I changed my mind in that moment. And uh, I, I won't hesitate to start anybody anywhere along the circle they want to because it's not a linear line, apparently. Mm. Wow. That's really good. We've got some mm. other wins of the week. Let's see what we've got here. Clint, win of the week. And it's an acronym. I invented a new acronym. Isn't that so cool? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was Brent Hickman that did that. Got to give Brent. Uh, Clint successfully completed the Mantis X Double Action Diligence course. That's a win. Good job, Clint. Nice. 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 Catherine 
finished my dry fire curriculum I wrote for work. That's good. Good. And Nancy's win of the week. Oh, Nancy, <laughs> you've got my heart. You've got my heart taking my class last Saturday. Nancy's a great student. I really love her dearly. She's a great person. And Haven Defense Company's win of the week. Scheduled classes and started to develop a new class curriculum in my head. <laughs> Next <laughs> week, I will start writing it down. Very good. All right. Awesome. Oh, Scott's got a win of the week here. Scott's been getting after it, man. 20-inch box nice. jump, 10 in a row on his 61st birthday. Yes. Or is it your 61st birthday today? Wow, that is a big win. Good job. We are rooting for you, Scott. That is for sure. That's awesome. Okay, so before we get into the Q&A, which will be sh relatively short. I mean, actually, who cares if it is? Whatever. Let's do our thing. Mm -hmm. um, the next little section all ties in together. Uh-oh. Where did he go? There he is. <laughs> Where did you go, Brian Hill? <laughs> I didn't Scared do anything. Me. <laughs> I don't, I, maybe I pushed a button. Okay, so the last thing I'm, we're going to talk about, and this is one of the struggles that people have talked about on the Facebook group, and that is confidence. And what I'd like to say about this is I believe that confidence is tied into the other things we're going to talk about, which is uh, a byproduct of discipline and knowing yourself and and resilience so what do you have to say about helping people build confidence in whatever they're doing so our self-image is is essential to doing a good job uh, but it can't be lied to uh, it has to be understanding really what we're capable of uh, and that's why measuring ourselves constantly is very important and understanding our strengths and our weaknesses and in addressing that with our self-image uh, the number one indicator of success is always real confidence. It's not braggadociousness. It's not false confidence. It's real confidence. And the way we do that is we develop every day by doing the work, which gives us this kind of buttressing effect that we know we have done and created current level of skill, which allows us to bring it to the task at hand. Mm -hmm. So as we create and we work and we move forward or we have words actions and deeds this creates the image of who we are and we know what we're capable of it also keeps you safe from feeling like you've been out competed by somebody else because the true competition is always with yourself and we say that mm -hmm. but if you know you did your best job and the other person beat you and you don't have to listen to nonsense like you know second place is a first place winner if you did everything you can and you brought your current level of skill to the task, that's sufficient. Now you have something to work on. And that's how you continue to move forward over and over again. The way we approach failure is it's a process of correction and we dust ourselves off, which makes us resilient. And a resilient person is an impossible to defeat. But even more important is we want an anti-fragile person. Uh, this is something that's been coined. There's a good book on it. But it means that any system that can be approached by very robust pressures and continue not only to survive, but to thrive, will create a self-image and a usefulness. I'll give you, a, for instance, of what all that word mumbo jumbo means. <laughs> uh, I had a robust business. Uh, my gym was very successful. Uh, lots of fighters coming in. I taught uh, fitness classes. I taught kickboxing classes. I taught children's classes. So I, I, my market was very well secured. It wasn't one thing. The only thing it couldn't overcome was the virus. Uh, the virus shut my doors three weeks before the government decided to do anything because frankly, people weren't going to come. So in that moment, I lost the definition of who I was. Four decades of work simply ceased to exist. And then I got sick and almost died. And I had to make a decision. I decided to close the doors because I knew if I kept throwing money after it, it would never get better. And I never knew if it was going to recover. So I threw myself on the winds of change. Uh, I started teaching at, at our home range here, developed a pretty good course, had a lot of people come to class, and then the, the county shut me down. So I couldn't mm -hmm. teach her anymore. So then it forced me out on the road, which is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's made me anti-fragile because I it doesn't matter what comes this way. I welcome this because it, my, my self-image is now, it doesn't matter. Uh, I will continue to adapt and to change and overcome these things and become more robust as I move on. And my resilience is not dependent on the job I do or where I live or how much money I make 
or all that. It's dependent on who I am and whatever comes or goes, whatever moment, how I react to it gives me true resilience. And that's the motivation to always do better and to set an example. And this year I've decided to try to be more vulnerable with people, you know, and that's, yeah. that's not easy, but that's, that's another anti-fragile thing for me to do because if I can expose my weaknesses, what can you do to me? What mm. can you say? Cause you know, YouTube is horrible. <laughs> oh yeah. I get, <laughs> I get a lot of, I, you know, I should dress better. I look funny. I should shave. Yeah. I should gain weight. I should lose weight. And you get all these yeah. horrible negative things, you know, but you learn there's something good in there. And the funny thing is like, you know, most people that are really interested, they don't say a whole lot. Uh, they watch, they take the mm -hmm. information, they go to work. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we change our self image. We don't listen to those silly things. We pay attention yeah. to the things that matter. We listen yeah. to the good people and we yeah. pay attention to it. We get better, set killer goals and off we go. And you also have a good attitude. I remember you talking about, this was another impactful moment for me when you said, when I step to the line to shoot, I think to myself, I get to do this. And mm. honestly, Brian, when you said that, I now when I step to the line, I yeah, I'm excited and nervous at the same time. But my overall attitude is like kind of giddy <laughs> most of mm -hmm. the time. I'm kind of yes. giddy about it. And I'm like, ah, I can't wait to do this. I'm so excited. And people kind of make fun of me on, on the range and at matches and stuff. And like in a fun loving way, you know, because I just get so much get so excited about it. Um and I love that because I see people all the time who step to the line with pure dread, fear, doubt, all of it, all over their face. And and if if you enjoy shooting, then maybe you should consider turning that perspective around and thinking, I feel so blessed to be able to be able to do this today, you know, if you truly love to do it. Yeah couple quick things on that. Uh, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, it is the, the, the father and mother of all virtues. And what happens in our brain is biochemically, we release these really great series of things in our brain that make us feel really good and process information. And when you release the struggle like you did, and you embrace it instead, you ride that wave, what mm -hmm. happens is the cycles of the brain change in that moment. And then it becomes what's possible instead yeah. of what could happen. And most people live in two kingdoms they can't enter, in, in, enter ever, the past and the future. So they're worried about how the future will work out, and they're going to have the future that they're worried about because it's self-fulfilling, or they're mm -hmm. trying to correct a past that they have no power over. You know, I'm not going to miss this shot again, or I hope I don't miss this. But we all get a chance to do stuff we love, and we get to do it. The only consequence is a score or a time or an outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a wonderful chance to be alive and to be present and mm -hmm. to be fully human in that moment and to stand in front of people and do your work. And what a great opportunity is. And the wonderful thing is once you embrace the struggle, you forget about everybody else anyway, you know, right. It becomes just your event. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like it sounds so easy, but that little flip of the switch in my brain made a huge difference. And I'm not saying I'm that way all the time. I'm not. Um, but most of the time I am. Most of the time I'm super excited. Like when I was teaching class last weekend, um, I had to make sure there was no point that I squeal or jump up and down. <laughs> Because I had to be a professional, but you know, I think everyone thought that was endearing about me. So um, I didn't look at it as a, as a negative and there's a time and place for stuff too. But um, okay. Last thing I want to go over really quickly. I always say really quickly, like I'm rushing, but um, <laughs> with you, I don't think we need to rush anything. Um, so this book I've been reading is called the comfort crisis. It's by Michael Easter. Have you ever heard of this book? I have. So you recommended it to me. <laughs> Did I? Yes. Okay. So here's the book for everybody that's not seen it. It's by Michael Easter. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I have gathered some really interesting statistics from this book that he has done research on. And basically the, the gist of his book is, is not only from a research standpoint about discomfort and how actually leaning into uncomfortableness is, is the path towards growth. And, and 
being more content and happy in your life, but also um, his journey with Their people. Okay. I think we're still here. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. The internet, you froze up for a while. <laughs> the internet wanted to take me down. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he went on this, this journey into Arctic Alaska with another guy who was more experienced than him. Two other guys, I think. And it was just this incredible journey of grit and uncomfortableness. And he had done and experienced this before. But the whole book just talks about uh, his um, reflection on that. But here are some statistics I pulled from the book, which I think are really interesting. Did you know that only 2% of people in America take the stairs when they have the choice of an escalator? Did you know that 70% of Americans are overweight or obese? Did you know that 20% of eating is driven by psychological hunger or physiological hunger. Sorry. So 20% of eating is actually because we're hungry. 80% of it is because of boredom or stress or just habit. Cause it's noon. So it's time to eat, which I, I was floored to hear that. Um, 95% of our time in general is indoors in a temperature controlled environment out of the sun. And, um, and that we spend a majority of our life never, really being challenged much and that he says that we live life on a dinner sized plate and we never exist in, we never explore the edges of anything and that the average person spends 11 hours a day. I can't even believe this to be true. Is it, could this be true? 11 hours a day engaging with digital media of some kind. So that could be on your computer or an iPad or that's insane to me to think, but I guess that was one of the statistics. So what, what he said in there is that humans actually thrive on challenges and that how we grow is through what he calls through a toughening process. Um, and he took a poll and found out that a majority of people that have had challenges in their lives, um, the people that thrive the most are the people that either that they're the people that don't have like extreme challenges all the time because those people have, have a lot of mental stress because the people that are in high uh, challenging environments all the time, whether that is poverty or environmental or whatever that may be is not good for their health. And then the people that have like almost no challenges at all are in a poor mental state. It's the people that are in the middle that learn from the challenges that come into their life and they grow and keep building on those, or they seek out discomfort on purpose are the ones that are actually um, the best mentally, which kind of makes sense. Um, and then the last thing that I, that I took from this, I want, and I'm just throwing all this out there, then you can give me your thoughts is he talks about the benefits of boredom. So one of the things he experienced in Alaska was they didn't have any kind of, entertainment of any kind. And he went from our culture and all of us know what that's like to literally in the middle of nowhere and had nothing to do. And they were hunting and they were just like waiting for the caribou herd to come through or whatever. And he said that the benefits he found from boredom that nobody hardly experiences anymore because of our devices is creativity, uh, introspection, taking in our surroundings, and he said it's actually a survival mechanism, boredom is, if you allow it to exist in your life, that tells your brain to do something else more productive and allows your mind to wander and explore other options and move on to other things. And so um, anyway, the, other, the last thing I'll say is he said that the, the rest of your life gets easier whenever you lean into uncomfortableness regularly. So the, that makes sense because what you learn about yourself by doing hard things applies to and bleeds into the rest of your life. Same with if you never challenge yourself and you live cushy, comfortable, 
and you never challenge yourself, then that bleeds into your life in negative ways as well. And one of the things that he tries to do every year, and I don't know how to pronounce it, masagi or something, is it's uh, one really hard thing in nature that you only have a 50% chance of finishing. And the only other condition is that you can't die. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> things that are almost impossible. And he tries to do one of these things once. You what do you think about all of this? I think it's wonderful. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you should read the book. You know, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm about halfway through it now. I think this is exactly what we're talking about. One of the reasons in class, like if I have somebody who steps the line and I ask them if they're ready and I say, I guess so. Uh, my thing oh, is I'll yeah. dismiss them from the line. Uh, I want you to lean into your challenges. I want you to step forward. Uh, the idea that uh, we, you know, we can't be alone with ourselves anymore without being entertained, that we just can't sit because we can't stand ourselves. And in order to stand ourselves, we have to challenge ourselves and we have to do things that are hard and we have to be bored in that moment before that and think about it. And really, you know, we've lost that. Uh, we, we get to see so many things and we have more information at our fingertips than ever, but we actually have less wisdom because we don't have the experience, you know, and uh, truth is not power. Uh, applied truth is power. We have to use it and we have to get the experience from it. And, and knowing that, you know, you have been sorely tested. Um, I was hit by a car when I was 22 and I was going to lose my right leg and was in a wheelchair for six months. I was told I'd never walk again. Uh, I was told I'd never do anything. So I leaned into that. I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get back to fighting. It took me a year and a half. Uh, I fought at a fairly high level. Uh, I just wasn't going to be stopped by any of this. And we have a saying in martial arts, which is us, which means never give up. Lean into these challenges. And, and there are real challenges in everybody's life. We don't want your challenges to be so overwhelming. You know, when, when, when all you do is try to feed yourself and you stay hungry all the time, that's all you can think about. But mm -hmm. we've got the great ability to, you know, get on a motorcycle and ride across the country and experience weather. Uh, or go for a long walk in a national park or, you know, go take a new class, uh, you know, a CrossFit class or go to a shooting class or go to a competition. And these are all challenges that we can lead into that we can become stronger in a moment. And this is the way, you know, I hate to it say is. that it's, yeah, but this is the real way of human beings. And no matter how comfortable you are right now, uh, we've all learned it can disappear in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So if you don't develop it in the easy times and you're you're weak right now, what do you think is going to happen when the real test comes along? So why don't you go and get some on your own? If you decide you want to go do something and it's hard, you've already gotten half the challenge done. Mm -hmm. we got to learn to endure. You know, we don't know how to endure anything uncomfortable. That's why I don't, people don't practice. You don't have to jump off the deep end either. You can just no. start small. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. A little bit. 20 minutes of exercise. You know, uh, listen, the, the science says if you'll get up and walk three times a day or two times a day for 10 minutes, you'll get rid of most of the statistics you quoted before. But people can't be bothered to be interrupted from their fantasy that isn't life. You got to get up and go do something. You, you got to be present. Uh, you know, love your kids. Be present for your spouse. Uh, embrace your community. Go do some work fix your house practice all these things are these, these are essential uh the rest and of it's it, not just it it, you know. it you're gonna be better for it that's the thing it's not mm -hmm. like we're pounding this and saying well you need to do it because it's yep. the thing to do it's it's what we say is the it's you're gonna be happier you're gonna live a more fulfilled mm -hmm. life yeah and that's what we're it's, here for i mean that's why we have this show yeah, yeah. your first so, enemy is you <laughs> you know at Always. the end of the day, your first enemy is you, and that's the one you got to overcome. So if you want real defense in your life, get some mastery yourself and understand how you're going to act and how you're going to feel and what you're capable of. That is, those are some wise words. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. So you want, uh, we got three questions here. Do you have time for those? Good. I got okay. time for you all. Always. <laughs> Thank you, because we are over the hour. So Jan right. wants to know, do you also think we don't have the accountability to others or ourselves is another reason why? I wonder what she's referring to. I know, Jan. And yeah, you know, our accountability is uh, 
so there's a thing in human beings that's really interesting. Uh, we like to say whenever it goes well, we did it. And whenever it goes poorly, external events were against us. But we judge other people just the reverse of that. Uh, we say, well, he's not timely, but I didn't make it today because time because traffic was bad. This mm -hmm. is the lack of uh, accountability in it. And, and, and the effect in our mind is one of our biases that we don't hold ourselves accountable. Either, you know, if you feel like the successes are yours, yes, and the failures are too. Uh, and, and you you will hear a lot of people put it on an external thing. My pistol didn't shoot well. My sights are off. Uh, I didn't get enough caffeine. I didn't get it. It's everything except them. And I think at the end of the day, uh, we can't be responsible for everything, but we can be responsible for our own performances. And some days are not up to standard. So that tells you what? Go home, get to work, create a better practice, uh, create skill that, that is worthwhile and get better at it. And I think accountability is a, is a true thing that is missing because we think all good things come from us and then everything else that the world is against us. But the world is incredibly savage and random. It doesn't really care that much about you, right? You know, Not we have as to much care about each think. other. Yeah. Yeah. We got to care about each other and we got to care about ourselves to do the work. So accountability is a big part of that. Absolutely. Chris has a statement, not a question. I don't have any questions for Brian, but I will say this. I admire Brian tremendously. I admire him for what he is today, what he's gone through in his life, and how he works every day to improve. I, I appreciate that more than you know, and it, and it means the world to me. And I look forward to seeing your journey, my friend. And one last question, I think, unless there's others. <laughs> Adam wants to know what did you do to change your splits physically <laughs> above and beyond the mental or is it just mental <laughs> you know so this is a really great question I'm, I'm very excited to talk about it uh, I was watching uh, Ben Stager and Joel Park and Kwanzaa Kim and they were talking about this drill which is the pairs and so what you basically do is you just shoot the gun as quick as you can two at a time but you don't worry about the outcome. You just simply watch it and you shoot it as quickly as you can. So Adam and I both came from a background of very precise shots. And so there is a conditioning in me that just won't let me let go of that. So I kept shooting this and I wasn't very good on the first five sets of pairs. But by the time I got bored enough not to care anymore, what I realized <laughs> was that the group kept getting smaller. Because I wasn't doing anything more. I was letting myself correct it. And I was shooting as fast as I would. And then I looked at the timer and all of a sudden I had 17 splits with better accuracy. Because I just simply let go enough to shoot mm. at that level. Now, I'm not saying it exists everywhere, but it let me let go. And what it utterly proved to me is the more I shot those, the better the groups got. And the faster my shots got because I was allowing the intuitive part of my mind to do the processing instead of the critical part. So I was yeah. no longer telling myself how to do it. I was just simply watching it and I'm correcting it because I'm not tense. And I'm going to say this again. I said it earlier. Tension is prejudgment of the outcome. And if you have so slow spits, what for me, what it was, was I put a lot of tension in my dominant arm so I couldn't move my fingers quick, but I put a lot of tension into my yeah. dominant critical thinking and said, it has to be this way. And when I simply just received the information and watched myself shoot, it was freeing in that moment. And it took, I'm not saying it happened overnight, but now I've been making myself demonstrate it in class because I'm incredibly uncomfortable with it. And <laughs> what happens is the first shot goes right where I want it. And the next one's up high. And then I, I don't really like that, you know, so I just keep shooting it. And what I, I do is the more I let go, the faster and closer they got together. And suddenly wow. now I have, you know, I, I've seen a couple 16s come out of my gun. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm doing it, but it's this just shooting. And there was a kind of a, you know, I was taught not to shoot fast and I was taught it was reckless to do so. And then, you know, it's wasteful of ammo and every round has to hit the target. And what this does is it's repetitive enough that I can see the pattern and my mind starts working on the recognition of that pattern and it lets it go down to finer details. So it becomes uh, more efficient with less effort. So 
That's a Try cool it. feeling too, I bet. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I've never been able to get over it. I've always had 20 yeah. splits uh, and I never miss, uh, you know, which is part of the problem. And then, it, and then what's happened is I'm shooting a lot faster and occasionally I get a high one. And then I say, did I see anything? And I get curious about why that happened and it just comes right back to it. And uh, they have a couple of good videos, uh, you know, Ben Stager's videos on this that you can look up at them. You get a lot of benefit out of it. Uh, it's a weird drill, uh, but I've been using it for people to teach them how to truly track the dot. Cause I realized that uh, single shots are ruining dot tracking and yeah. they're not getting the most out of it. And uh, this kind of doubling and it's just shooting, you know, you just look at the center of the target and just keep watching. And it's just amazing. And uh, mm. I'm really excited because it's been like a nine month plateau. Uh, because your draw can only get so fast in performance mode. So, you know, I got a pretty good draw, but a, a one under performance mode is pretty good. And, and if I want a two second build drill, I got 0. 0.2 splits. I can't have any error in that. And then I watch my friends like AJ Zito, you know, he hit a one, one draw, but he's got 13 or 14 splits. So it's like a 170. Riley does the same thing, you know. So they got this kind of cushion in there. So the other day I walked out and did a cold build drill uh, and the draw was faster. It was a 90. And then I had a, a bunch of 18 splits in it. So, you know, without trying, it was in the 180s. Uh, and it was a very different experience because I was able to make myself comfortable enough because I'd done so much with the doubles to watch it, just to watch mm. it, not to correct it, allow myself to trust the process that I can correct this, that I'm a good enough shooter and tension doesn't do it. And it's a, it's a great way to overcome tension. So I think it would help anybody who's suffering that problem. Adam has no tension when he shoots at all. <laughs> <laughs> Strong wind. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, man. You're welcome. I hope it helps. I had to give a dig to Adam. I, he'll, I'll pay for it later. You just wait. I'll pay for it later. You will. Yeah. You'll be doing this drill with him. <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah, because that's exactly what I need to work on, too, letting go. Hmm. So is there anything you want to wrap us up with? Any final thoughts? And where can people find you, Brian? Are you going to be on the road? I am on the road. Uh, I'm going to Mississippi and I'm going to Indiana and I'm going to a bunch of places. Uh, I teach deliberate coaching this weekend. So check the schedule. It's the complete combatant.com. That's the complete combatant.com. <laughs> Everything's on there. Uh, we're on all sorts of social media on Instagram. I'm the chief chaos controller. And then there's also a complete combatant channel. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. I do videos for active self-protection extra and uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. So wow. we're covering everything. Yes. And the thing I'd like to leave everybody with is my favorite saying, you're good enough. Mm. Be good enough. Don't over aim. Be good enough and know that we're all flawed do the work and do it good enough for yourself and compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Get better, get a little bit better than you were each day. Don't look for the reward in it. Just know that exponentially it will be there and it all comes rushing in at once like that. You know, for those of you that have never suffered the trigger problem I'm talking about, <laughs> I have. I mean, I, it's God awful, you know, <laughs> And I, I was just told it was unfixable. So I couldn't accept that, though, because, you know, I'm a stubborn human being. And yeah. what I found is I, I just needed a different way to approach it. And it came from a place I never expected it from, you know, and that's the beauty of YouTube. Uh, I could watch a, a national champion discuss it uh, free of charge and get this <laughs> drill and go work on it. And yep. so there was no excuse except my utter loathing of having to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Did I went out there off. and I got good enough. Yeah, it was good enough, but it was not fun. And I didn't want to do it, <laughs> but I did it. So that's good. so cool. Now you yeah. just got to get it on camera, Brian. Of course. That's no problem at all. <laughs> There's always a camera turned on me, apparently. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're getting used to being on camera now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Brian, you're you're just wonderful to have on. And I hope that you will maybe in another few months come back on and We'll just keep digging with all of the struggles of, of our um, followers, of the viewers, because, you know, that's why we're here. And that's why we're doing this is to help whoever we can through our own struggles, right? In our own stories, because mm -hmm. everybody starts somewhere, right? You're not alone. Yep. Everybody's been down this path. We can help you. And I, I'm just a great fan of yours. 
and uh, <laughs> I'll do anything I can do to help you, your program, uh, your viewers. And I just appreciate the time. And I'm grateful and humbled that uh, you, you let me come on multiple times. And I just enjoyed this so much. And the unintended consequences, we worked on this quite a bit beforehand because that's our nature. And yeah. uh, I think yes. it, it get, there's a whole bunch of other stuff now that I... You know, I made notes for the show. For next time. Well, no, this is this get... show. Oh, okay, okay. And it's things that I work through, and I, yeah. I, it gave me a great idea to incorporate some of this because this is what's bothering people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So let's work on it. Yep. Exactly. So keep shouting out in the Facebook group, and we'll keep you know yeah. addressing whatever your concerns are because that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. So, all right, Brian. Until next time. Thank you. All right, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so next week we are going to have Tatiana Whitlock on, and uh, that will be on June 28th. Guys, we're almost through June now. Summer's flying by, and um, before you know it, it'll be Christmas. <laughs> Just kidding. So Tatiana Whitlock is the national director for a Girl in a Gun Women's Shooting League. She's trained with the top names in the firearms industry and prides herself on being a dedicated student of the craft. As a firearms instructor, she teaches nationwide, working with men, women, and youth to establish a real-world foundation of firearm skills and safety and situational awareness. She's a member of the Walther Arms Defense Team, and she also serves as a director of training at Howe's Indoor Range and Shooting Academy in Gray, Maine. She's also a featured host and instructor on Trigger Time TV airing on the Pursuits channel, as well as a contributing author for numerous industry publications and the NRA Women's Network. So next Wednesday, June 28th at 7 p.m., we will have Tatiana Whitlock on and uh, would love to hear from you guys if you have any questions for her um, for the show. And uh, I will look forward to seeing all of you beautiful people next week, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Until then, take care.